and a tragic update out of Escambia County, Florida tonight. The body of a private investigator missing for more than a month has been found. Saying that that body they found around noon today is believed to be that of Taylor Wright. Deputies have charged Wright's friend, Ashley MacArthur, with second degree murder. Hey, Zach, your, your wife is, uh, she's being arrested this evening and charged with murder. What? Ashley MacArthur. She's accused of murdering Pentacola private investigator Taylor Wright. I don't know where she is. Where is her body at? I don't know where she is. She's dead, though. You know that? You had a young woman, Taylor Wright, it was murdered. There was no question about that. She was shot in the back of the head and, and buried. Do you know where Taylor Wright is? Do you know if Taylor Wright's dead? Did you kill Taylor Wright? And what else did she say about finding her? Uh, that she told me they'll, they'll never find that bitch. She's gone. There will be no physical evidence showing you that Ashley MacArthur had anything to do with the death of Taylor Wright. As to the charge in count one, we, the jury, find the defendant, Ashley MacArthur. This is what he's going to tell you. I'm going to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, need to find the defendant. It's a beautiful place. Uh, we're a place where people vacation. So we have the Pensacola Mabel Air Station. Love our Blue Angels, uh, world famous for those. It's a great town, a great place to raise your family. Like all uh, cities, we do have murders, but uh, you know, anytime a murder comes up of this nature, it certainly draws attention. Uh, first name is Taylor, last name is Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. Taylor Wright was 33 years old when her body was found, more than a month after she had been first reported missing. Taylor should have called me. Taylor would have called me, and she didn't. She was a former police officer from South Carolina turned private investigator. The mother of an eight-year-old son, Taylor moved to Pensacola after a contentious divorce and fell in love with a woman. We met um, on an on a online dating app. We were in a relationship for a short period of time, but uh, enough time to have sincere feelings and to say that I love this person, and she's told me she loved me back. Cassandra Waller is a public school administrator who soon invited Taylor to move in with her. Uh, she was kind. She was outgoing. She would give you the shirt off of her back. She was full of life. She was full of energy. She had all kinds of hope, had great big giant ideas. But there were issues in Taylor Wright's life. Her new girlfriend suspected she was using drugs and had caught Taylor cheating on her with another woman. And Taylor and her ex-husband, Jeff Wright, were still fighting over their son and their money. I just know that Taylor didn't feel like it was equal. In violation of the court orders, Taylor had withdrawn $100,000 from a joint account with her ex-husband and asked another of her new Florida friends, Ashley MacArthur, to help her hide the money by putting it in Ashley's bank account. But now the divorce judge had ordered Taylor to show up with the money or face jail. So the night before Taylor went missing, we went out to eat, and Taylor was just really stressed out. She was talking about how Ashley was holding on to this money, that Taylor needed to get it back, and she, she felt awkward about it. She felt like something wasn't right. The next day, Taylor and Ashley were set to go to a bank in Pensacola to pick up the money Ashley had been holding for her and we gave each other a hug and a kiss. And at that time, I'm walking out of my driveway, Ashley pulls up. I say, hey, Ash. And she's like, hey, Cassandra. And um, I said, you guys have a good day. I'm, I got in my car and I drove away. That was the last time I ever saw Taylor. A few hours later, Ashley called Cassandra to say that instead of going to the bank, she and Taylor had driven out of town to go horseback riding on a farm in East Milton owned by Ashley's family. 
was like, weren't you guys supposed to go to the bank? She goes, yeah, t you know, Taylor's really stressed out with the divorce stuff, and she's just been really emotional today. These are the things that she's telling me. Tell her everything's fine. Like, there's, we'll, we'll get through this. Later that night, she got this text message from Taylor's phone. Saying, I I'm, I'm sorry, like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I started getting uh, angry and upset because here we were in a relationship. I'm thinking Taylor's telling me that she needs time to herself and she's not including her partner and it hurt my feelings. And as the days and nights went by, Cassandra Waller was both worried something had happened and then angry Taylor might have left her for someone else. I sent her texts, I tried calling her, nothing. No responses, nothing. But after more than a week, what had begun as a missing persons case for police soon took on an ominous cast. Everyone is initially a suspect. So certainly Taylor's ex-husband um, was certainly on everyone's radar. And Cassandra, Taylor's girlfriend at the time. But very early on, we treated it as if it were a homicide. Being handled by two detectives, Chad Wilhite and Richard Gigliotti, who had just been promoted to detective. The first thing we did with this case was contacted Cassandra Waller. They, there was a time they came to my house, and at one point, they, Detective Gigliotti crawled under my house. So I'm sitting on the front porch with Detective Wilhite bawling my eyes out because this is embarrassing. Why am I being looked at? My intention right now is not to arrest you for anything. Um, I'm trying to find out why your so, girlfriend's disappeared. And here I am in this room that they would use to interrogate people, and it's it's padded walls. It's a place you don't want to be. I can't help but be scared that I'm going to get in trouble for something that I did when I was trying. She's in her inner circle. She's her girlfriend, so she needs to be pressured as well during an interview to gauge her reaction see how honest she's being with us. Those questions do got to be asked. If you knew who harmed her, would you tell us? Absolutely. If she was dead right now and you knew, would you tell us? I don't know. Did you harm her? They asked me if I killed Taylor. And I lost it. When Ashley MacArthur was brought in for questioning as the last person known to have seen Taylor Wright alive. So let's start that day from the beginning. She said she doubted any harm had come to Taylor Wright, offering suggestions about her whereabouts. She wanted to appear as, she, as though she was cooperative, right? And she wanted, she didn't want to um, deny anything that we asked. She wanted to seem cooperative. Telling the detectives Taylor might just be off on a drug bit. The only thing I worry about is with the drug situation. Like I wouldn't even, if I didn't know about the drug situation, I wouldn't be worried about her. I would say Taylor's doing what Taylor does. But then that lifestyle becomes a different group of people. Sure. Which is what I worry about with her. Hmm. Yeah, we don't know that she ever had intentions on leaving. Maybe she wanted to go have fun and then someone found her with a bag full of cash. We don't, and that's, that's why we we have to follow it on every single avenue and ask all these questions. Cassandra's understanding was, was that this money was in a safety deposit box of Ashley MacArthur's uh, at Wells Fargo. So when Ashley was asked about a safety deposit box at Wells Fargo, she said that there was nothing. Have you ever had a safety deposit box there? Yeah. There was no safety deposit box, there was no account at Wells Fargo with money, that that was, that didn't happen. But text messages on Taylor's phone made it clear Taylor thought her money was at the Wells Fargo. Talking about meeting at the WF, likely being the Wells Fargo. Needing to get there, needing to get the money. Clearly that was a problem. We spent time driving the route that Ashley MacArthur gave us that they took uh, looking for surveillance footage. They found this surveillance tape at a gas station, nowhere near the bank, 
where Ashley says they stopped to buy Taylor a beer around 10 in the morning. Have you ever seen her drinking at that time of day before? Yeah. That's that was odd yeah. behavior. And in fact, I said something to her. I was like, beer at this time of the morning? She well, was like, well, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. I'm like... <laughs> it's a perfect response. Then Ashley told the detectives they headed out to the horse farm in East Milton. So we just drove out there, and she was just blowing off steam, I guess, and drinking beer. And <laughs> we were just hanging out. She was a strange girl. <laughs> Ashley claims she then drove Taylor back from East Milton to Ashley's home, and that Taylor called an Uber and left. She was fine. She just said that she wanted to go have a beer and that she was going to get an Uber to take her to go have a beer. What detectives would soon discover was another claim from Ashley MacArthur that would not check out. When we contacted Uber, Taylor's account hadn't been used in months. Something was wrong. Something was definitely wrong. Now, more than a month since Taylor Wright went missing, Cassandra Waller was increasingly desperate to find out what happened to her, pleading for help on Facebook. Nobody's reached back out to me. I still haven't heard from her. Nobody's heard from her. So I'm, I'm calling hospitals in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Alabama. And Ashley MacArthur was busy calling the detectives to suggest where Taylor Wright might be hiding. Ashley, how are you? Um, well, how are you? Unaware that she had become the prime suspect. She got back on the cocaine. You know, do, do we need to, like, you know, look in alleys, you know, for her? Or? She's definitely curious on what we're doing and where we're at. She's definitely fishing for information. Uh, but uh, we didn't want to tip her off. Um, I was just calling to see if there was any update or anything going on. And, and so on a regular basis, she would call me. And I had to, of course, be friendly with her. I hate to bother you, but I just want to check. All right, thanks, Ashley. And I couldn't answer the phone, surely, and say, yeah, so, you know, we'll be arresting you here shortly. Uh, you just wait. The turning point in the case came from the records of cell phone towers, which keep track of which cell phones are nearby. Your cell phone's always communicating with a cell tower, and the cell phone companies know exactly which tower it's communicating with. And the data showed that Ashley's timeline, her alibi, did not check out. And when we got that information, that's when we really found out, okay, Ashley and Taylor never went out to this East Milton farm, family farm that Ashley was saying they went out to where they were supposedly riding horses. We knew right away, very big deal. The tower records instead showed her on that day about 30 miles away in the northwest part of the county. And what is she doing up there? Um, Detective Alverson and I um, had to, she had the great idea of, let's check the property appraiser's website. And we typed in Ashley's maiden name, which is Britt, and it popped up the first uh, property record search found 2201 Britt Road. And lo and behold, it was uh, in the cell phone tower data information that we were receiving, it was right in the middle of all that data. It was a good moment. We're like, okay, we're getting somewhere. And at, at that point, were you pretty sure she was the one? Oh, certainly. Yes. Certainly. We had cell towers of her lying. We had the bank records, her depositing the money. And, and we have uh, surveillance footage from banks showing her depositing Taylor Wright's checks. Checks that are signed Taylor Wright, but it's not Taylor Wright's signatures. They're not her handwriting. But the detectives had to keep a tight lid on their suspicions because Ashley's husband, Zach, was also close to people in law enforcement, a former county sheriff's deputy. In fact, we didn't tell many people here that Ashley was a suspect in the case because we didn't know who, what ties she had with people. Now it was time to bring Ashley back in for what would be a showdown round of questioning. Hi, how you been doing? You know, we've turned up some things that we don't we don't really know what to think at this point. We knew this was our, going to be our last interview because at that point, we knew all the search, the three simultaneous search warrants were going on at, at her house, at the farm, and at her family business. So before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say against you can be used against you in court. Detective Gigliotti played the role of the good cop, Will Hite, 
the bad cop. I don't have a problem confronting people with um, what I know is a lie. Someone has to play that role. And I was fine with it at that time. Starting with the cell tower death. You had the ability to plot all your phone calls for that day. But when we started plotting all the phone calls that you and Taylor were making that day, um, there were some discrepancies in what you had told us. Okay. Okay. Um, we know that you didn't go to Milton when you said you went to Milton. We did go to Milton. Not when you said you went there. You went that evening. Next, Taylor writes checks. Do you have a signature that is? Mm -hmm. It says Taylor's name, but it doesn't really look like her signature. Would you maybe wrote her name on there by chance? Probably not. And then finally, what happened at that farm on Britt Road? What were y'all doing out there at this farm? So we know y'all were there. We picked up some um, stuff that Taylor had there that me and what was that? she had stored. Um, some kind of lockbox that she had. So why would you not tell us that originally? Because she asked me not to tell anyone ever. That's not good. I gotcha. Okay. Uh, she seemed to get really closed off, I would say, um, kind of turning away. I think she crosses her arms and her legs, if I remember correctly. I think I actually reach over and try to break that defense down. So let me give you for a second. Don't cross your legs and look over for a second. So you can tell she was definitely uncomfortable at that point. What was going through your mind at that time? The detective was having none of it. Where is Taylor at? You need to tell us where she's at. I don't know where Taylor is. I don't have a clue. So you're the only one that was with her on this day at this farm that you did not disclose to us? I didn't do anything to her. You say this, if she's at that farm, we're going to find her because we're executing a search warrant out there right now. That's fine, but she's not going to be there. Then where is she at? I don't know where she is. Where is her body at? I don't know where she is. She's dead though. We know that. She had two options, either tell us what took place out there or ask to speak to an attorney and terminate the interview. Tell us what happened. I think at this point I need an attorney. The detectives had no choice but to let Ashley MacArthur leave the police station. The search at the Britt Road farm had still not turned up anything. About an hour or two after she walked out of this department, uh, we, I was on the phone with one of the supervisors out on the uh, Britt Road property, and uh, someone yelled in the background that they had a, a skull. I had no question in, I think, either of our minds that this was most certainly going to be Taylor Wright's remains. And a tragic update out of Escambia County, Florida tonight. The body of a private investigator missing for more than a month has been found. The body found in a shallow grave at the Britt Road family farm, covered with concrete and potting soil. Hey, Zach, your, your wife is, uh, She's being arrested this evening and charged with murder. What? But Ashley MacArthur had not broken under the questioning, had not confessed to anything. Would there be enough evidence for a jury to convict? For the record, we're here on the state of Florida versus Ashley MacArthur. Defendant is present with counsel assistant state attorney is present. And once again, the Law & Crime Network has picked a phenomenal trial, Florida versus Ashley MacArthur. But there's cameras here, there's camera over there, there's microphone. This has nothing to do with you. If 
anyone has to sit up straight, it's me. If anyone has to put on lipstick, it's me. This is a criminal case. The defendant is charged with first degree premeditated murder. I think I've covered everything. I think of Ms. Jensen. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Um, what you will see at the end. Bridget Jensen is the chief of the homicide unit in the Escambia County District Attorney's Office. I think one of the most difficult things to overcome was Ashley herself. She was this very small, very pretty, kind of meek, quiet-spoken female who'd never been in trouble. Um, so from the outside looking in, no one would think that she would do something like this. And really what you will see in the end is that Ashley MacArthur had the motive to kill Taylor Wright, money. She had the opportunity to kill Taylor Wright. She did, in fact, kill Taylor Wright. And then she tried to cover it up. But to get to that ending, we have to start at the beginning. Taylor Wright withdrew $100,000 from the bank when she wasn't supposed to. And then she was trying to hide that money from her ex-husband. And she also asked her friend, this defendant, Ashley MacArthur, to help hide the money. You will see the pressure that Taylor Wright was putting on Ashley MacArthur to get this money. And the reason that matters is because the money was gone. Ashley MacArthur had spent it. Friday, September 8th, 2017 is the last day that Taylor Wright is known to be alive. She was with this defendant, Ashley MacArthur, and they were supposed to be going to the bank. Taylor Wright was never seen alive again. Ashley MacArthur was represented by a father and son team of lawyers, Barry and John Barasset. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as you, as you sit through this case, you will see. The evidence isn't there. There's reasonable doubt in this case. And that's what I was trying to convey to them in the opening statement. There will be no physical evidence introduced in this trial showing you that Ashley MacArthur had anything to do with the death of Taylor Wright. There will be no eyewitness testimony introduced into evidence showing you that Ashley MacArthur had anything to do with the death of Taylor Wright. There will be no murder weapon introduced into evidence that has any connection to Ashley MacArthur. The first witness called by the prosecution was Taylor Wright's ex-husband, Jeff Wright, who had briefly been considered a possible suspect. Were you and Taylor legally divorced? Yes. Essentially had to clear him. And I think if the jury didn't hear from him, it would be um, probably a weakness for the state's case. Mr. Wright, did you reach out to Ashley MacArthur on Facebook? I did. And did you ask her um, if she maybe knew where Taylor was? I did. And what, res what responses did she give you? She said that she had last seen Taylor with two backpacks, um, significant amount of money, that Taylor was nervous about the upcoming trial. The defense used Wright's testimony as an opportunity to raise a question of whether he had a motive to harm Taylor Wright. She had antagonized a lot of people, and especially over the divorce and the money uh, issues with her husband. Fair to say that Taylor Wright was making it very, very difficult for you to get this money back. That is correct. But MacArthur's lawyers knew that police had established Jeff Wright's whereabouts hundreds of miles away in North Carolina, and they knew better than to outright accuse Jeff Wright of the murder. Yeah, yeah we can't lose credibility with the jury. We can't make it so incredible that they don't believe us. On the second day of the trial, the prosecution called Taylor Wright's girlfriend, Cassandra Waller. She was nervous about making eye contact with Ashley. Now, do you see Ashley MacArthur in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please point to her and identify what she's wearing? She's right here. She's wearing a black outfit. And then I looked at Ashley. Ashley never looked at me. Ashley was always looking down at her scribble pad. Let the record reflect this witness has identified the defendant. During the course of your relationship with Taylor Wright, did you ever have an opportunity to see her handwriting? Yes. Did she write you letters? Yes. Did she give you cards? Yes. Were you familiar with her handwriting and her signature? Yes. Again, I'm showing you State's Exhibit number 26. 
that look like Taylor Wright's handwriting? That is not Taylor's handwriting. Or her signature? Or her signature. But on cross-examination, Cassandra Waller testified she never saw any evidence of threats by Ashley MacArthur against Taylor Wright. In all the times that you saw Ashley MacArthur and Taylor Wright together, um, you never heard, saw anything to indicate to you that Ashley MacArthur was threatening to harm Taylor Wright, causing her, you know, going to cause her any physical harm, anything like that. No. And no indication that, that Taylor Wright was scared of or anything like that. No. The defense then raised questions about Cassandra's own, at times, challenged relationship with Taylor Wright, citing the text she had sent to Taylor on the first day she was missing. As those text messages show, you called her a liar. I did. You called her a drug user. I did. What I was trying to point out is that Taylor had a somewhat volatile life. Going back to late July uh, 2017, you indicated to us that you received information that Taylor was having some sort of relationship with another woman over in Mississippi, correct? Yes. She had the secret girlfriend in Mississippi. She was known to use drugs. Just because you don't hear from her on September 8th or 9th doesn't mean she was murdered at that point. That was the point I was trying to make with Cassandra. It's, it's got to be clear as day that I have nothing to do with this. And the, the fact that they still played the, it, that I could have possibly been somebody for the jury, that could have ruined my reputation, my professional career. They'll throw anything and everything out there. That's not okay. Testimony would show that Ashley came from a solid middle-class family, but could often be found in strip clubs and sketchy bars where her girlfriends and a bartender testified she talked the night before Taylor disappeared about killing her with an overdose of cocaine she had just purchased. Did Ashley tell you either before, during, or after you went to Babes what she was going to do with the cocaine? She said that she was going to put it in Taylor's beard. What did you hear Ashley say? Um, that this world would be better if Taylor wasn't here and that she wasn't a good person. There's one time she said that she's too small to hurt anybody, she'd just shoot them. And then this, the night Taylor went missing. Did you ask Ashley what she did with the cocaine? That she put it in her beer and Taylor spit it out because she said it tasted sour. The prosecution's case depended heavily on Ashley's motive, that she could not give back Taylor Wright's money because she had already spent it on a man with whom she was having an extramarital affair, a bar owner named Brandon Beatty. At some point, did you and Ms. MacArthur start a sexual relationship? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So w I was able to trace $30,000 in cash that Ashley had used to buy her boyfriend a boat. Was she paying the Gulf Power bill at Sticks? She did a couple times. Um, was she buying supplies at Sam's Club for your business? Yes, ma'am, she did. Okay. In approximately August of 2017, did she buy your motorcycle? I'm not sure that they, but yes, she did purchase a motorcycle. Okay. A purchase made a few weeks before Taylor Wright went missing. How much and how often was Ashley MacArthur spending money on you? Uh, I'm sorry? Um, I, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest with you. Okay. Pretty um, regular. And um, what did she say about her friend being missing? Uh, the, the police had took her phone. Or she told me that the, her, the girl had ran off with her husband's money or something, and just like this, gone. <laughs> okay. And what else did she say about finding her? Uh, that she told me they'll, they'll never find that bitch. She's gone. But the defense would have its own cards to play, including a video of Ashley MacArthur that would give her lawyers a surprise opening to undercut the prosecution case.
Hurricane Dorian, now a Category 2 storm, strengthening this morning, threatening to hit Florida as a major Category 4 hurricane. In the middle of the Ashley MacArthur murder trial, Pensacola came under a hurricane watch. And in the courthouse, Judge Jan Sackelford urged the lawyers to speed things up. So what I read in the most recent update was alarming. Showing Dorian on the move, you see it right there, making its way through the Atlantic. As you can see, this storm is just getting bigger and bigger. But prosecutor Bridget Jensen was intent on playing the full six hours of the two police interrogations of Ashley MacArthur. I think that was important because the jury gets to see Ashley MacArthur. I wouldn't think so. Like, I don't, I don't believe Taylor's been harmed. I just, I think Taylor's doing what Taylor does. If you looked at the first interview, uh, Ashley was almost kind of flirty, maybe a little playful with law enforcement. Has she ever come on to you or? Taylor asked me one time if I would have a threesome with her and some guy. And I'm like, no, thank you. Um, and the second interview, her demeanor was was so different. I think she knew at that point, um, you know, she was probably caught. So you're the only one that was with her on this day at this farm that you did not disclose this? I didn't do anything to you. Okay. She's at that farm. We're going to find her because we're executing a search warrant out there right now. That's fine, but she's not going to be there. So it was good, I think, for the jury to see um, that she had lied and she got caught up in her lies and, and couldn't come up with excuses fast enough. Then where's she at? I don't know where she is. Where's her body at? I don't know where she is. She's dead though. You know that? Know. You know, uh, this is a perfect example of when you talk to law enforcement too much, whether you're guilty or innocent, it's going to come back and hurt you. And the father and son team of defense lawyers could do little to challenge much of the other prosecution's evidence too. The gruesome photos of Taylor Wright's body wrapped in a hammock in a shallow grave. A bullet hole in the back of her head. The testimony about the cell phone towers that put Ashley MacArthur at the crime scene. You have in the cell phone records the maps that were put into evidence. Cell tower near the Britt Road farm at 12.10 p.m. The forged signature on Taylor's cashier's check deposited in Ashley MacArthur's bank account. Taylor is missing and she is still depositing Taylor's money and the suspicious text messages from Taylor's phone after she was likely dead. But then a video that the prosecution hoped would help clinch the case gave the defense a surprise opening. Surveillance video from a Home Depot of Ashley MacArthur buying concrete and potting soil the day after Taylor went missing. A store clerk, Devante Sims, helped her make the purchase. I was walking through the store and asked her, did she need help? What was she looking for? A uh, type of concrete. What type of concrete? Uh, she's, she just said she was, <clears throat> sorry, okay. uh, like a facetting concrete. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? A facetting concrete. But then, looking at the crime scene photos, Sims testified the textured rocky concrete on Taylor Wright's body appeared to be different than what Ashley MacArthur bought. Is the concrete that this lady purchased, is it textured? Uh, no, ma'am. It's uh, like a uh, fine dust. Is that is it like rocky? No, ma'am. What's it say? No, ma'am. The defense was jubilant. I leaned back and made a comment to my dad. The comment was just boom, like I was happy, you know, and I'm sure you can get the photographs. He said the concrete that Miss MacArthur bought was very fine like dust. The concrete on top of Taylor Wright's body was very pebbly rock. You could see rocks in it. It was not fine like dust. And then, the defense set out to prove in its case that Ashley MacArthur would not have been able to lift a 50-pound bag of concrete or even Taylor Wright's body because of a back injury she suffered eight years earlier. Her mother, Rhonda Britt. Did you see her ever lift any heavy objects? No, she tried not to because um, it hurt her back. Have you ever seen her lift anything like a 50-pound concrete bag or anything that heavy? No. And is that to this day? Yes. I think it definitely was hard to picture how this little girl could move a dead body. But at the same time, Taylor was not a big girl either. I think where there's a will, there's a way. 
in the end, the defense case rested mostly on the fact there was only circumstantial evidence, no fingerprints, no DNA tying Ashley MacArthur to the crime scene. When you were here, you were the lead investigator for the Escambia County Sheriff's Department on this investigation, is that correct? Yes. As far as physical evidence or forensic evidence, you never found any physical or forensic or trace evidence that linked Ashley MacArthur to the homicide? I did not know, sir. It is the state's job to give you everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. And you heard some very unflattering information about Taylor Wright. And you may not like some of what you heard about Taylor Wright, but in this trial, she is the victim. So let's not forget that she was the 33-year-old mother of a child and she was a human being. And our laws in the great state of Florida do not classify human beings. So her life means no less than anyone else's. And this woman sat there hour after hour in those interviews you saw her, calm, cool, collected. Not one ounce of sadness or concern or worry for her friend that was missing. She was so forthcoming about all the bad things that Taylor did, but you know what she wasn't forthcoming about? Those deposits of Taylor's money that she made and that property on Britt Road. And why? Because as she sat there giggling and laughing and joking with law enforcement on September 18th, she knew that Taylor was out there on Britt Road because that's where she murdered her, and that's where she tried to cover up her body. Ladies and gentlemen, Ashley MacArthur had the motive. Ashley MacArthur had the opportunity. Ashley MacArthur murdered Taylor Wright, and then she tried to cover it up with lies, concrete, and potting soil. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Barry Barasset. We're here about a murder case, the most serious crime you can be charged with. She is not charged with stealing any money. She's not charged with lying. She's not charged with being unfaithful. She's not on trial for anything other than first degree murder. They've gotta prove that the crime occurred and they don't have any physical evidence. They have none. There's no DNA linking Ms. MacArthur to Taylor Wright's death. There's no trace or scientific evidence linking her. You've seen enough on television. You see what happens when somebody's traumatized, uh, if they've done something, if they've killed somebody, or if they've seen somebody kill somebody. You just don't turn that on and off. There's nothing to indicate anything in her demeanor through these videos that they've got that they put in, or her clothing or her dishevelment that indicates that she was killing somebody or dragging somebody's body around. There's nothing there. And that's strong evidence, physical evidence that you can see, not something that the state is suggesting. Here's the kicker, and on the concrete, you have photographs. She put one of them up on the screen, a big one, and you saw the concrete. That concrete was rough concrete. It is not the concrete that she purchased. When you consider the evidence and the burden that the state has, I ask you to do your duty in this case because there is a reasonable doubt, and I ask you to return a verdict of not guilty of Ms. McGarth. All right, we're back on the record, State of Florida versus Ashley MacArthur. My understanding is we have a verdict. They were out, I think, four hours, and you never know. You never know. That seems like an eternity while you're waiting. It's 12 people. Um, you know, it only takes one person to, to find a hole that, you know, that they don't think she's guilty. Let me talk to everybody in the audience. Somebody out there is going to be unhappy. I don't know what the verdict is. I know there are some family members and friends for Ms. MacArthur and presume that there are family members and friends for Taylor Wright. I was in the courtroom. I am like two pews right behind Ashley. 
So the jury came in and there was a lot of unknown, what's gonna happen, what's gonna be said. And this judge, she, she talked about making sure that everybody was gonna control their emotions when the verdict was read. And, and I was afraid. I, I had no clue what was gonna happen at all. Mr. Faust, were y'all able to reach a verdict? Okay, all I want you to do is to hand it to court security, okay? I'm gonna hand it to the clerk to publish. Yes. In the circuit court in and for Gambia County, Florida, state of Florida versus Ashley Britt McArthur, case number 1717CF005844A, 1717 verdict as to the charge in count one, we, we the jury find the defendant, Ashley McArthur. guilty of first-degree premeditated murder with a firearm as charged in the indictment. So see we all, David A. Faust, four-person, dated August 30th, 2019. So I was trying to fight back all, all the tears and all the emotions and everything that I had been through. So we knew that if she's convicted, the judge was gonna sentence her right away, which the judge, judge did. I need all of you to stand. And Ms. MacArthur, I'm gonna ask you one question. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? If so, say I do. Okay. Ms. MacArthur, I wanna make sure that I ask you personally, do you want to say anything to the court? Okay. All right, then, Ashley MacArthur, have been, having been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt by a jury of your peers of first degree premeditated murder with a firearm, I am going to adjudicate you guilty. I'm going to sentence you to life with a mandatory minimum 25 years state prison. In the end, justice was done. And she'll spend the rest of her life. She will spend the rest of her life in prison. She's gone. She's really gone. And this is done. It had been two years. And it was finally a book closed. It was, we're done. She did it. They had a young son together, and they were kind of looking forward to a night out. There's surveillance video of her inside the bar as well as outside, and it's at that point where she gets up and uh, exits the patio and is last seen leaving uh, towards the west. Brown County 911, what is the address for your emergency? We just found a human body laying in the Okay, okay. And you know where she is or what? We have an explosive new trial for you out of Wisconsin. This is the most brutal murder that has ever been committed by one person in the history of Brown County. Doug murdered Nicole in a fit of jealousy and anger fueled by insecurity, alcohol, and numerous other drugs. You knew all along what happened to Nikki. No, I did not. All Nikki wanted was a ride home. A ride home. Back to the... This is what he's going to tell you. How to get out of that situation. And I grabbed the gun. He's trying to no. find the first place to put a body. No, sir. The only thing they could do was kill him. You want to say anything? We, the jury, and to find the defendant.
Friday, Saturday nights, a good nighttime party life here in downtown Green Bay. And on this warm spring night, the action is at a place called the Watering Hole. It's a friendly atmosphere, but it's, it's really large. A lot of people can fit inside. Somewhere among the hundreds of people dancing and rocking out with a band from California, the Steel Pants, is a young woman who would not live to see the dawn of the next day. Her name was Nicole Vanderheiden, Nikki, at the concert with her live-in boyfriend, Doug. They had a young son together and they were kind of looking forward to a night out and it started off really well from what we know. But both of them were drinking heavily, police would later say, especially Nikki. Plus she was breastfeeding, she had a young son, so her tolerance probably wasn't what it used to be. When the concert ends, Nikki and friends head to another bar, the Sardine Can, with Doug saying he will catch up shortly. There's surveillance video of her inside the bar as well as outside. She can be seen on the video dancing, having a good time. But still, no Doug. And we know that there were text messages between her and Doug accusing him of staying behind, maybe talking to other women. Nicole was starting to get irritated and upset with Doug because here she is with all of Doug's friends and she doesn't know them very well. And her boyfriend, who she wanted to spend the night with, is not there. Eventually they move outside to uh, an outside patio area. Um, and it's at that point where she gets up and uh, exits the patio and is last seen leaving uh, towards the west. A friend tried to stop her and confront her, but just couldn't get her to stop or listen. And she just kind of kept walking down the road by herself. What happened next would not soon be forgotten in this small city in the American Midwest. Frog County 911, what is the address of your emergency? We just found a human body laying in the okay. suite. Okay, person beyond help, or do I need to give yeah. instructions for CPR? No, it's okay. beyond help. It's starting is to it a, Is it a male or a female? Uh, it's got long hair, uh, but I didn't go near it. You couldn't even tell who it was. Her face was completely black and blue. She had more than 240 injuries from what had happened. The only articles of clothing that were left on her body was a sock on each foot, uh, and then there was like a pink, pinkish colored uh, bracelet that you'd get from like an event uh, on one of her wrists. Brown County Public Safety, this is Therese. It was three hours later when another call came in to 911. Yes. Um... How do I go about, uh, I guess, a uh, missing person? It was Nikki's boyfriend, Doug. Okay, and who who's missing? Uh, it's my girlfriend, and she she does live with me, and she's never done this before. What's her name? Nicole Vanderheiden. Now, Detective Brian Slinger had a name for the victim and a name for a likely suspect. And what's your name? Doug Dietrich. They had already found the body, and here they have someone calling saying that they can't find their girlfriend. Obviously there were some things that were concerning to us. Um, you know, why did you wait so long to make this phone call, especially when you have a newborn baby at the house uh, that needs mother's attention. Um, so it kind of painted a picture that maybe Doug had done this. An officer was dispatched to Doug Dietrich's home. I'm here for a missing persons yes. report. We used a audio video recording device uh, to record it so that we could get a look at him. You know, we focused on his hands, we focused on the general condition of his body, uh, focused on the condition of his house, his behaviors. Dietrich was not told about the discovery of a body just three miles away. Do you suspect any follow play? If so, why? Just, I don't know, I, I don't suspect it, but this the area she walked in, I don't know, definitely don't like. Okay. His story was he went to bed, uh, woke up once or twice through the night to use the bathroom and to take care of the baby, and uh, woke up the next morning, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, somewhere in there, and she still wasn't home. Dietrich had not called in the missing person report until 4 in the afternoon. I'd be lying if I said we weren't alarmed with his level of concern. The level of concern did not seem to match what it should be, I guess. So that night, detectives got a warrant to search the home Doug and Nikki shared. 
It's probably the first person you look to, the boyfriend, the fact that there was a falling out that night. Mr. Dietrich obviously was a person of interest right away. And Dietrich was brought to the sheriff's office for what would be a grueling three hour late night interrogation. The detectives, Brian Slinger and Lee Kingston, wanted to know why Doug had waited so long to call in the missing persons report. I wasn't feeling good all day. I was hungover and feeling like shit and then not wondering if I was thinking she went off with another guy, whatever. All this shit going through my mind. After about two hours, the detectives finally tell Dietrich about the body found in the nearby farm field. I don't think it's been 100% identified as her, but there's a lot of similarities. What do you mean a lot of similarities? It's a physical description. Height, uh, blonde, belly button ring. They are watching him closely to see his reaction before asking him essentially if he killed her. And you don't know where she is or what happened to her? Not a clue. Did you, did you do anything to cause her to go missing? No, not, not at all. Besides uh, being an asshole a little bit on the phone, I mean... Now, the detectives raise the stakes, telling Doug Dietrich they want the clothes he was wearing that night when he was out with Mickey, and that they are already searching his house for evidence of a murder. Is there anything in your... When they go search your house, they're going to find anything, anything in their house they're going to find that's going to, that's going to say to you anything? Absolutely nothing whatsoever. <laughs> nothing to do with this. I mean, <laughs> For the next half hour, as the detectives watch, Doug Dietrich sobs almost uncontrollably, at one point saying he is scared. Sorry, just turn it on. You're scared? I want her back. She needs to go back. I need help. Tell it. Were they the tears of a grieving boyfriend? Or the tears of someone who was scared he has been caught? Green Bay, Wisconsin is all about its football team, the Green Bay Packers. Um, yeah, pretty much anywhere you go around here, it's Green Bay Packers. Yeah, if you don't love the Packers, you might get booted out. <laughs> it's green and gold here for days and days and days. But the stadium was empty. The football season had not yet started. On the spring weekend, Nikki Vanderheiden was killed. And so her brutal murder was all anyone talked about. Many people said, how can such a brutal crime take place in Green Bay, Wisconsin? How can somebody commit such a random act uh, in our community? Not in my backyard, like. It was very scary. I mean, can't think of anything worse. A, a random attack like that um, on a young lady at bar close, you know, in a, in a small 100,000 person community and. The shock of Nicole Vander Heinen's death was felt throughout this family friendly city. By all accounts, she was a very good teacher and she was an excellent mother, a smiler, somebody who they said would light up a room. Nikki was the mother of three, two from a previous marriage, and the third six-month-old Dylan with her live-in boyfriend, Doug Dietrich. She really cared about her kids and would never have done anything to put them in harm's way or in jeopardy or to leave them alone. The first big break in the case came with a call from two joggers out for a morning run coincidentally caught on a student driver's dashboard camera. We were out jogging that morning at about 5, 5.30, and we had to jump over a pool of blood in the road. And if you look close on the right-hand side, you could see where the blood and stuff is. And then a neighbor found more of the grisly evidence on his lawn. 
including a wire cord he had run over with his lawnmower. That's absolutely where the murder took place. The, the blood that was collected there, um, the hair samples, and then that cord uh, that was found, which we believe is like a phone charging cord, came back all positive with uh, Nicole Vander Heiden's blood DNA. And then detectives began to hear from Nikki's friends and relatives that Doug had been abusive to Nikki. She's been very depressed lately. Why has she been depressed? Her sister Heather said Doug drank heavily and used cocaine. And then my mom said that two weeks ago she told him, her, that he has been beating her. She asked, has he ever hit you? And she said, yeah. And my mom said, you need to come live with me. You're going to go home. And she didn't. And one of Doug's former girlfriends, Rebecca Mott, came forward to tell detectives how Doug could be jealous and often violent. We got a fight, tackled me, and I broke my ankle. He would, um, you know, throw stuff, break stuff, but I mean, I would too. He wasn't the most stand-up citizen or the best boyfriend by any means. And now the search warrant at Doug's home began to produce results. Nicole had some significant prints on her back that appeared to be a, a shoe, which is like a herringbone pattern that's common on the bottom of uh, Air Jordan or Nike Jordan shoes. Uh, we located a pair of shoes in, in Mr. Dietrich's garage that had that similar pattern on them uh, that also had some red staining, red drops on the bottom of them that we figured was consistent with blood. And inside of Nikki's car, parked in the garage, was what appeared to be blood splatter, blood drops in the back seat. We were pretty confident at that time that, um, that Doug was responsible. Our theory at the time was that somehow Nicole got home, there was a disturbance or some sort of disagreement out in the street or in the driveway, and then the theory was that Doug used her vehicle, which was in the garage, to transport the body. At 7.03 p.m., attempting contact with Doug Dietrich. What's the address? Less than 72 hours after Nikki's body had been discovered, Detective Brian Slinger was on his way to Doug Dietrich's house to arrest him for murder. We'll talk down there and I'll kind of explain to you what's going on. He was pretty, I mean, he was emotional. He had had the chance to speak to a family attorney uh, prior to his arrest, so there was no interview after his arrest. He was just transported to the, to the jail. Doug Dietrich's arrest for the murder of his girlfriend sent another shockwave through Green Bay. He comes from a pretty well-off family here in the area. He had a pretty good life, and so people just thought he was kind of, you know, a rich kid, kind of getting away with what he wanted. Dietrich had no alibi for his whereabouts that fateful night when Nikki walked off into the darkness. And the friend who was with him that night, Greg Matthew, appeared to the detectives to be evasive about Doug's movements. Because I'm going to tell you that there's no doubt in anybody's mind that the evidence shows that your friend, Doug, had involvement in her murder. There's no doubt about it, okay? And the friend became upset when detectives asked him about Doug's whereabouts in the hour before the babysitter, Dallas, said Doug had returned home. Who can vouch for you for the 60 minutes before you showed up and made contact with Dallas. Who can vouch you for that? What is this 60 minutes? One hour, I'm asking for a one hour period of time. Who can vouch for where you were if your phone is dead? Thank you, guys. So nobody, that's your alibi? Nobody, that's your alibi. Your alibi is the guy that's supposed to be for murder. The evidence against Doug Dietrich was building, but the case was about to take another dramatic turn all because of something the detectives saw on this body cam video of Doug Dietrich when he first reported Nikki missing. Breaking news on the case of the Brown County woman whose body was found in a farm field. 16 days after he had been arrested for the murder of his girlfriend Nikki, Doug Dietrich was released from jail. Doug, how do you feel? He's not going to have any comments. People were really shocked and were like, what are police doing? How can they let a murderer go when we know, or we thought we knew, that he was the one that did it? 
But behind the scenes, the case against him had completely fallen apart. A lot of what changed was we were getting evidence back from the crime lab. There was a lack of physical evidence tying Doug to her body, to her clothing. The blood found on his Air Jordan shoes was not that of Nikki Vanderheiden, but that of a turkey. Who would have known he would have went turkey hunting a week or two prior and there'd be turkey blood in the garage. The blood found in Nikki's car wasn't hers, but that of her daughter and the vehicle couldn't have been used to move the body as police first theorized. We're able to find out that that car did not move that entire weekend. And then the clincher. We went back and looked at the videos and we had noticed that Mr. Dietrich was wearing his Fitbit. The day that we interviewed him at the house when he called in the missing person, we started thinking about, can we get the data off that Fitbit to show was he moving around that night? The device was turned over to crime technician Tyler Bailey. Fitbit is an activity tracker that you wear on your wrist, similar to a watch or a bracelet. There was a, a short amount of steps recorded in the middle of the night, consistent with you know someone getting up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. Uh, and then after that, there was another period where there was no movement recorded from the Fitbit. Doug Dietrich's Fitbit confirmed his alibi. And there, there was no way he would have gotten up in the middle of the night, went out into the front yard, committed a brutal murder, drove a couple miles away, and then came back home. Detective Brian Slinger had worked hard to destroy his own case and clear Doug Dietrich of the crime, but still felt bad about first arresting an innocent man for murder. He missed the funeral, he missed certain things, he was, he was painted as this, and I think you know anyone would be lying or they said they didn't feel slightly bad about it. Okay, well then who do they think did this? Is this person still out there? Are they in the community? I think it was pretty scary for people living in that area too to realize that, okay, if Doug didn't do it, who did and where is this person? And the key was to find whoever met up with Nikki Vander Heiden sometime after she walked away from this downtown bar and then killed her. Police didn't have a clue. We reenacted it numerous times, we walked the path and she kind of walked off into darkness and, and that's kind of where we were at. It would be two full months before a breakthrough. Got a call from the crime lab telling me that they were able to get enough DNA off of one of the socks, of all things, from her body uh, to enter it into the CODIS system. The CODIS system is a nationwide registry of DNA collected by the FBI. Anyone who has ever been arrested will be in there. And they got a hit from the state of Virginia uh, for George Stephen Birch. George Stephen Birch had been arrested in Norfolk, Virginia in 2001 for murder, but was acquitted at trial. He had five other criminal convictions and was on probation for one of them, requiring him to stay in Virginia. You know, I'm thinking, is this a transient? Is this a, a truck driver that may have been in the area for the weekend? Um, how, how is someone from Virginia's DNA showing up in, in Green Bay? What the investigators did not know was that George Birch had been living in Green Bay for some three months in this house, the home of Linda and Edward Jackson. I met him a long time ago back in upstate New York. Him and his wife were separating and he knew I was doing very well out here so he asked me if he could come out and get a fresh start. He was extremely polite. He called me Miss Linda and I kind of liked that. Just very personable, very, very personable. Birch was a regular at a bar three blocks away from the Jackson home, a place called Richard Cranium's. He was so fun-loving, you know. Everybody at um, Richard Cranium's called him big country, and he was six foot eight, tall guy, but very friendly. He was always, I guess you'd say, very charming towards the girls. He had no problem with walking up to any girl and just talking to them and striking up a conversation. The Jacksons say they had no idea the man staying in their home was being sought in the Nikki Vander Heiden murder investigation. In fact, Ed Jackson and George Birch had gone fishing the very day her body was discovered. Oh, he was real happy. He had a big smile on his face and holding it up. And um, That picture actually played a big part in it also because uh, when you focus in on it and you look at his right hand, you can see the cuts on his knuckles. But detectives only learned that Birch was in Green Bay after he seemingly outsmarted himself. We had no contact with him with the Sheriff's Department. Um, however, Green Bay Police Department did have one contact with him from right around that time frame. It was from a minor hit-and-run traffic accident involving a Chevy Blazer that belonged to the Jacksons. 
when the vehicle was found, the front seat had been set on fire. It was the same vehicle Birch drove the night of the murder. And at that point, the Jacksons called in for a stolen vehicle. And the last person to use that vehicle was George Birch. And he said that, oh, I must have left the keys in the car. Somebody must have stolen it. But now George Birch's name was in the police department database, along with his address. So I jumped in my car and ran out to that house, and there he is, standing on the porch smoking a cigarette. And even better, he had given his cell phone to the police to clear his name in the earlier investigation. It basically mapped out his night and gave us a lot of the answers that we needed to have. The GPS app from the phone showed Birch spent most of the night at his favorite haunt, Richard Cranium's, where detectives believe he met Nikki Vanderheide. She was just looking for a ride home, and then he ended up bringing her home and sexually assaulting her in front of her residence. She's inside of a vehicle, um, fell out the, the passenger side onto the ground, which is where he proceeded to um, curb stomp her or stomp her head into the ground, stomp her back into the ground, which is how the footprints would have got, shoe prints would have gotten on her back. And then the phone moved and went directly from Nicole's residence to the scene where the body was located. So his phone showed him at every single crime scene location and basically mapped out that night for us. Now authorities were sure they finally had the right person who had taken Nikki off the quiet streets of Green Bay and killed her. Breaking news out of Green Bay today, 38-year-old George Birch was arrested this morning for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden. Investigators say Birch has been tied to the scene of the crime with forensic evidence. George. Uh, I'm going to take it back some more time and I'll see if we can come up here. But George Birch was a cool customer, showing little emotion once he was in custody. At six foot eight, 270 pounds, towering over Detective Brian Slinger as his handcuffs were removed. I told him that he was under the arrest for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden, and I wanted to speak to him about that. His face didn't change one bit. Okay, so is this something that you want to talk to me about? Sir? About that? You don't want to talk to me about that? So if I read your Miranda rights, you don't, you don't want to talk to me, so I would prefer a lawyer. Okay. But once at trial, George Birch would have plenty to say offering a version of the night that would turn the trial into a real whodunit. George, did you murder Nicole Vanderheiden? No, sir. Definitely not. You know who did? Doug Beecher. Now both men would be on trial. We have an explosive new trial for you out of Wisconsin. It's taken the nation and all media outlets by storm. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. It was 40-year-old George Birch who was on trial for the murder that had shocked the city of Green Bay, Wisconsin. That a violent, ruthless killer could do what we believe the evidence will show Mr. Birch did to Nikki Vanderheiden. But the lawyers for George Birch sought to turn the tables on the prosecution case. The defense came out swinging. We're going to show you how horrible Douglas Dietry is. Telling the jury it was Nikki's boyfriend, Doug Dietry. Not George Birch, who had the motive to kill her, just as investigators had first believed. Doug murdered Nicole in a fit of jealousy and anger, fueled by insecurity, alcohol, and numerous other dr drugs. The evidence is going to show you Doug did this. At the very least, it's going to give you significant doubt about whether or not George did this. And so, for two full days, Doug Dietrich was on the witness stand, once again having to defend himself. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Prosecutor David Lassay took him through what happened the night of the concert, the couple drinking and dancing and happy, leading up to a dramatic moment. Doug, when was the last time that you personally saw Nikki alive? <sighs> it was going to the bathroom and see you in 10 minutes, whatever, you know? and. It's the last time I saw her. The prosecutor paused to let Doug Dietrich's emotion play out. From the bench, Judge John Sikowski 
a former district attorney himself, appreciated what the prosecution was trying to do to overcome a major challenge. It would be the fact that Dietrich was originally um, arrested. He would have had more of a motive. He would have been a likely suspect. Do you have absolutely any involvement in Nikki's disappearance or death? Uh, no, I did not. Thank you. No further questions at this time. But the cross-examination of Doug Dietrich would be aggressive and brutal, starting with text messages he had sent to his mother just before the night that he felt trapped by Nikki. I don't recall that, ex ex that conversation. How about when you told her, I'm very seriously thinking about telling Nikki and the kids they have to move. I'm not cut out for this life one bit. Do you remember that? Um, I remember, you know, it, I think I sent something on the lines of that, and I was having a, you know, a little downer day or whatever, and um, I just said that to my mom with not truly meaning it, I guess. Did you often say things you didn't mean to your mom? I mean... Yeah, it's, sometimes I would, yeah. I mean, it is my mom, I'm very close to her, and... No. So since you're close to your mom, that means you lie to your mom? No, I don't say I would lie. I mean, maybe sometimes, but... And then to the text messages Nikki sent to him that night when he had not shown up. Did you hurt Nikki that night? Uh, do you mean physically or what? I, no, I mean. Did you physically beat her in the past? No, I never physically beat Nikki. So you just have no idea why she would say these things? Exactly. With Doug Dietrich back on the stand for day three, the cross-examination turned to why he had waited so long to call friends or family or police when he woke up early the next morning and Nikki wasn't there, suggesting he already knew she was dead because he killed her. Did you search for Nikki on foot or by vehicle? Uh, no, I did not. Still didn't call the police? I did not at that time, no. Because you knew you didn't have to? And now, boring in on his actions when police did arrive. And then you made sure that before police arrived, you took a shower. Yeah, yep. I mean, I was, I was feeling grubby and, you know, you wanted to needed to any, wake up and... You wanted to hide any proof that you were involved in her murder, so you took a shower before the police came. And then a final stab to make sure the jury knew that police, too, had at first believed Doug Dietrich killed Nikki. They knew she was murdered 118 feet from your house. I don't know what they knew, what they knew at that point. You knew all along what happened to Nikki. No, I did not. That's when the Brown County Sheriff's Office arrested you and told you you were under arrest for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden. Uh, that is correct. I have no further questions. The defense had planted its seeds of doubt. It, look, it's a classic jilted lover gets vengeance story. Yeah, it's classic. It's as old as time itself. This story. But the defense still had to find a way to deal with the overwhelming forensic evidence against George Birch, including his DNA on Nikki's sock and the GPS data pings on his phone showing his travels to and from the crime scene. The evidence that the state clearly presented it was difficult to overcome that. And so it was no surprise when his lawyers called George Birch to testify. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you down? Yes, ma'am. Given the, the situation here, the, uh, especially given the scientific evidence, Birch almost had to testify. And I think what he had to try to do was fashion a story that would somehow explain away the physical and scientific evidence. He wore a tie and tried to come across as a gentle giant. George Birch on the stand, sometimes he seemed likable. But sheriff's deputies were concerned that Birch was no likable gentle giant. Birch is wearing a stun belt underneath his clothes uh, so that it's controlled by remote control. They can, electric sh they can provide an electric shock to him in case he acts out in the courtroom. Hey, George. How you doing? Good. You've been sitting here for a long time. Yes, sir. Probably have a lot you want to explain to the jury. Yes, sir. 
Birch described meeting Nikki at his regular hangout, Richard Cranium's. I was slurring. And how was she acting towards you? Same, somewhat the same, pretty much. Um, slurring back and forth with each other. Birch said they left together and ended up outside her house, where he says they had sex in the back of a Chevy Blazer before someone attacked both him and Nikki. The, the next thing I remember um, was the, the person behind me had, had been saying, the first thing I was coherent to me that I could hear them say was, look what the you made me do. Did you know if she was alive or dead at that point? I didn't know if she was alive. Um, there was a lot of blood um, on her face, um, come out of her mouth, um, on her back. And again, at, at, at that point, did you know who that individual was? Never seen him before in my life. Do you know who that individual is now? Now I do. Who was it? It was Doug Dietrich. And he said Dietrich then ordered him at gunpoint to put Nikki's lifeless body in his blazer and drop it in a nearby farm field. What was Dietrich doing at this point? He was standing behind me with a, with a, with a he still had the firearm in his hands, um, pretty much directing me what to do. Birch's testimony, if the jury believed it, would explain perfectly why his DNA was on Nikki's sock why his phone GPS data showed him at the crime scene and at the farm field. George, did you murder Nicole Vanderheide? No, sir. Definitely not. Do you know who did? Doug Beecher. The final day of the trial was being televised live, locally and nationally. We're going to be covering the George Birch case today. There's a lot at stake with this story. So many twists and turns. People were so intrigued by it because they didn't think that this could happen in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And Nicole's family and Doug Dietrich and his family were in the courtroom for what would be the dramatic high point. Cross-examination. The cross-examination of George Birch by prosecutor David Lassay. What really happened was you drove Nicole home 20 miles away from where you live, fully expecting that you were going to have sex, right? That was your expectation. You were gonna have sex. That's why you're driving her home, right? Um, I was hoping that we would. Um, it was leading from what had happened before and where we had spoken. It seemed like that's what was gonna happen. And when you get there, and it becomes clear that Nikki isn't going to have sex with you, when she attempts go into her house and leave your vehicle, that's when your mood changes, right? No, sir. That's when things get aggressive, don't they? Not at all. That's when you grab that cord and strangle her, don't you? No, sir, not at all. That's when Nikki gets slammed on the ground repeatedly when she's trying to run toward her house, when those blood stains lead in the direction back to her home. None of that is true. Well, how do you know? You were out cold when Nikki was assaulted. Because you said I did it. And the next day, you're going fishing with your buddy with a smile on your face and not a care in the world. Um, it was a pre-planned event, sir, and I wouldn't say not a care in the world. That would definitely would not be something I would say. No further questions. It had been almost two years since that spring night when Nicole Vander Heiden and her boyfriend Doug were at the Steel Panthers concert since she sent the angry text to Doug, since she walked off into the night, since Doug was arrested for murder and then released when his Fitbit gave him an alibi, and since authorities tracked down George Stephen Birch after finding his DNA on Nikki's sock and on a wire cord used to strangle her. The case was about to go to a jury that would have to decide whose story to believe, that of Doug Dietrich, did you have absolutely any involvement in Nikki's disappearance or death? Uh, no, I did not. Or that of George Birch. George, did you murder Nicole Vanderheiden? No, sir. Definitely not. Prosecutor Mary Kerrigan Maris presented the state's closing argument. This is clearly a whodunit case. Ridiculing the defense's case. Their explanation is ridiculous and it's insulting to your intelligence. 
He tries to make you believe this encounter was consensual as far as sexual activity. Killing her is not enough. He seeks to defame her. Her life's gone, so let's go after her reputation. She's not here to counter these outrageous claims. That's very convenient for him. Nikki did not give up easily. She showed her spirit through the end. Nikki did not go gently into the night. We ask you to return a verdict of guilty for first degree intentional homicide. Thank you. In his closing argument, George Birch's lawyer, Lee Chuchart, did not back down from pointing the finger at Doug Dietrich. Justice for Nicole is not going to be delivered by a wrongful conviction of George Birch. Just because of a story sounds ridiculous or sounds unbelievable, doesn't mean it is. And I ask that you focus on all the evidence in this case, that you don't continuously ignore that the state arrested Doug Dietrich and there's a full scale investigation into Doug Dietrich. We've seen the evidence, we've seen him testify. He had the motive, the opportunity, and the connection to this crime. The first piece of evidence I ask that you focus on is when Doug Dietrich actually called the police. Yes, um, how do I go about, uh, I guess, with the uh, missing person? He didn't call the police until after Nikki's body was found. He knew why. He didn't want the police to come. He was trying to cover up what he did. As we sit here right now, you are literally surrounded by doubt. You are surrounded by reasonable doubt. That's why you must return a verdict of not guilty. Both sides expected the jury would need several days to review all the evidence and conflicting testimony. They got the case this afternoon after closing arguments from both sides, and we're waiting to see exactly how long they're going to deliberate today. Very unusual dynamic in the sense that it's not just, did this one do it, it's which of the two did it. The jury was back after only three hours. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we've been advised that you've reached a verdict, is that correct? The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Stephen Birch, guilty of first degree intentional homicide, is charged in the information. He just hung his head a little bit, but I don't remember him crying or showing much emotion. And jurors told reporters it had all come down to exhibit number 23, that piece of wire cord almost thrown away after being run over by a neighbor's lawnmower said that is what sealed the deal for them because Doug's DNA was not found on that wire, but Nicole Vander Heiden's was, and so was George Birch's. For an emotional two hours, Judge John Sikowski heard from Nikki's friends and family and from Doug Dietrich's mother, Diane. I have a hard time driving on Offman Road. The sight where Birch threw Nikki away like she didn't even matter. She did matter. We loved her and we missed her. All Nikki wanted from him was a ride home. A ride home. Back to Doug, back to her baby. In closing, please go home today. Hug your loved ones. Tell them you love them. Show them you love them. Nobody came to court to speak for George Birch. And now, wearing his orange prison jumpsuit, he declined to speak for himself. No, sir, Your Honor. You know, I just, just a thought, Mr. Birch. He said, yes, sir, and no, so the manly thing would have been to say, I did it, I flipped out, I did whatever. Cop will plea, do something. And step up to the plate. He chose not to do that. And still haven't done that. And then, just before passing sentence, the judge had one final comment about George Birch's behavior. Drop the body off in a field, and then 12 hours later, go on a boat and be smiling like nothing happened. Like you didn't have a care in the world. How can we explain that? 
that isn't human. That is not normal. In Wisconsin, we have life without parole, and that was the maximum sentence that could be imposed, and, and that's what happened. This is the most brutal murder that has ever been committed by one person in the history of Brown County. That's how severe this case is. This is a crime that would, I believe, merit the death penalty, and for that, you have to die in prison.